Have you ever wondered about how you are going to come up with the funds for your book project? You are wondering about illustrations and design, and there's so many expenses as a children's book author. Well, look no further. Today, we have a session to talk about Kickstarter, an introduction to Kickstarter, the pros, the cons, what can it be used for, and how successful can you expect to be? Well, today we're going to hear from Sarah Catherine Frey on exactly that topic coming up next. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Sarah Catherine Frey, who is a former student and current member of my team, a very valued member of my team. She has been doing Kickstarter herself, is going through her second campaign shortly, but she has helped dozens of authors who needed graphic design set up. And she and I together have led a couple of, of work groups of people who were going through Kickstarter so that we could help walk them through it. So you're getting a wealth of information today. I will pass the baton over to Sarah. Help me to welcome her and we'll go ahead and talk about Kickstarter. Thank you so much, Sarah, for doing this for us today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Yeah, as April mentioned, I'm a student from self-publishing made simple. And it's been such a blessing to be able to grow in this group. And I just love having the opportunity to come in and talk to you guys about various things. But Kickstarter is one of those areas where my heart is really at because that is what allowed me to create the book of my dreams. I had it envisioned since I was in high school. It, it really made it possible to, otherwise it, it would have still been a nice book, but it really allowed me to take it that step further. I don't know if you're all familiar with what Kickstarter is, but I know that originally I misunderstood what it was. And for a while, it wasn't even a consideration of mine because I misunderstood it. People think that Kickstarter is like a donation-based platform. Think like GoFundMe, where basically you're asking for money to go toward the creation of your book. And then if people want to buy the book, They'll have to do that later too, but that's not what it is at all. It is essentially a pre-order system, but the wonderful thing about this is you do the pre-orders and there's a whole strategy to it that we'll get into. And then after the campaign, if you succeed, you get those funds. The difference between this kind of pre-order system and other pre-order systems is Kickstarter is an all or nothing platform. This means that you, from the get-go, you set a goal, let's say $7,000. You say, I'm going to have this predetermined time. Most, the average length is like 30 days, about a month. So 30 days, I'm going to give myself and my followers to reach, let's say $7,000. If we reach that $7,000, your, the credit cards are charged, the funds come in a couple weeks later, and the creator gets to use those funds to print the book. And then whenever all the items come in, you fulfill the orders, and it's just fantastic situation. The scary thing is not everybody reaches their goal. So what happens then? Well, the credit cards aren't charged. So there, there isn't a risk to your backers. The only risk is you, the creator, may not reach the goal. That being said, if you have the time, it's still worthwhile to consider it because you don't pay Kickstarter fees unless you're successful. So basically, it works or it doesn't. You're not out any money if you don't succeed on Kickstarter. But it's a lot of work to go through to not succeed. So it is scary in that way. So I have found through a lot of research and uh, speaking with other authors and crowdfunding experts and uh, just following doing a lot of market research that there are ways, there's never guarantees, but there are strategies to help determine if this is a good system for you, if this is right for you, and how to best utilize your resources to have a successful Kickstarter campaign. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about today. I love Kickstarter. Like I said, it made me the, the 
children's book author I wanted to be. But it is a ton of work. I have a lot of authors who, after speaking with me, they're either extremely enthused and can't wait to get started, so excited, and others that are just kind of like, you know, I'm not really at that place in my life right now. I can't put that kind of work into a blitz marketing campaign. Totally fine. You, there's other routes that if you're part of the author work group, April, you know, teaches about, which I won't go into all of those today, but yeah, it's, it's a great avenue con to consider. Okay. So where to begin market research? So that's where I started. That's where most people find it valuable to start. Go to Kickstarter, just look around, preferably in the children's book area. There's a publishing section with the subgenre of children's books. And, you know, there's always active campaigns. Some seasons are a bit slower. Go take a look, current projects, and then also past projects. And you'll see some are successful, some are unsuccessful. It can be a little bit intimidating, but like I said, there is a strategy that can make you a lot more likely to be successful. But a lot of figuring that out is doing that market research. If you're looking at successful campaigns, like look through it. What do you like? Is it, do they have like eye-catching design? Do they have a great video that caught your attention? Just what do you like about it? Take notes and even save it. You can favorite things, save it. I do that all the time. Even when I'm not working on a Kickstarter, I browse and I'll just save them like, okay, this will be good reference later. And then for unsuccessful campaigns, try to figure out where they went wrong. Like a lot of the time you'll see that People set their goals way too high and I'll get into the approaches on that. But usually that's what I see is they set the goal way too high. And the other big, the biggest thing I see is that their reward tiers lack a, like, you know, a very cohesive, rational ladder strategy, which I'll get into that as well very soon. So yeah, just take a look see what you like, what you don't like, take note of in their reward tiers. I'll explain what that is. Their prices, like how much are they charging for their book? That's valuable for you. If you're going to do this, it helps you price your own book. Also, I recommend creating a Kickstarter account, maybe back a project. You don't even like if you, if, you know, if there's projects you feel really compelled to support buy a book or back a project. And if they succeed, you'll get the book. Or you can also even, if you just donate, not donate, but yeah, usually uh, you can do donations. Like if you donate like a dollar, just you may not get a reward for that, but you will get like emails about the updates they make. You'll just like kind of be brought along on the ride. So it's free to make that account. And not only is it free to make that account, it's free to start building a project. So that's where I started the market research and also just dabbling around with the interface, trying to get the feel for how do you put one of these things together? And then, as I mentioned about doing the market research, take note on the pricing and all that average price of the children's books and the, and the average pledge on those projects. I know when I was doing my first campaign, I found like $35 was kind of the sweet spot. And then you can do the math figure out how many backers you would need at that average pledge to meet your goal. Do you have the audience to reach that? That's the first step to setting your goal. And don't forget about those five to 8% fees. And also, you know, give yourself like a little bit of wiggle room, just like, you know, a fudge factor. And then beyond that, there are two main tactics for the goal setting. One is like that braver, riskier ta tactic where you add up all the costs, everything. Like if you're raising money for your print run, how much does that cost? If But if you're also hoping to like fund your illustrations, ideally you already have some illustrations. And even if you've like already fully paid your illustrator, you know, you'd like to have a return of investment on that. So, you know, add everything up. And I, honestly, I recommend doing this regardless of how, what you're going to set your goal, add it up, get a feel for how much do you actually need? to make that dream book like mm -hmm. what's what's like your home run if you could reach this and cover everything add it up and I mean you can set it for that <laughs> that's super brave I'm sure you know how much this can cost and if we're we can be talking what 15k 20k and that's kind of scary you know like to set that high of a 
goal, but people do it. And if you're in a position that it's kind of like, you know, if I don't get that, honestly, I'm going to go a different route. I'm just going to do print on demand through KDP if I don't reach that amount. And that's fine. Test the market. And if you don't succeed with the Kickstarter, it doesn't mean you have a bad book. It, it just means that you don't have the audience to reach that goal right now. It doesn't mean the book isn't worth publishing. That's why we have other options, whether you self-fund hardcovers or just go through like KDP. And then the other goal tactic is like kind of just, well, some people will flat out be like, I'm just going to set my goal for like $200 and whatever I make over that's gravy. That's, and that's fine. I, I wouldn't recommend going like that low because at that point you may as well just like, it's not, it doesn't incentivize that much, but I know I, on my first campaign, I didn't make my goal, the brave goal. I, I set it for 7,000, which was brave enough. <laughs> I felt like, so, so the only downside to setting a lower goal is, as I mentioned, that people are way more incentivized to be like, okay, I got to buy this book now to help this book get created as opposed to like, oh, you know, I'll just wait till it's, you know, on Amazon or whatever. It really incentivizes people. Like there's this teamwork element and there is a way to counteract that to a degree in something called stretch goals. Some people are incentivized by stretch goals. Some aren't, but if you get creative with them, they can be a great asset. They're not necessary. I, I know people are like, do I have to do that? And I'm like, no, you don't have to do that, but it can be helpful. Stretch goals by definition. If you reach your goal early, first, you have to let people know, okay, campaign's not over. We still have like the rest of the 31 days. So stretch goals, they can be all kinds of different things. People get so creative. My favorite kinds of stretch goals are doing things that either give back like donations oops, into the community or like something to actually make a better product for those backers. The ones that I did were, like I said, I set my goal for 7,000 and I was like, okay, for every hundred dollars past our goal, we will donate one book to a child who needs a silver lining. And then if we reach 8,000, we'll add silver foil details to the cover. If we reach 12,000, we'll upgrade to our first choice printer for best quality and faster turnaround time. 14,000, we'll create coloring pages for everybody. 16,000, we'll add extra pages to our book. And then my last big stretch goal was if we reach 18,000, we will donate 100 plushies. And for every hundred dollars past this, we'll donate one more plushie. So yeah, at my best advice is if you do stretch goals, find a way to add value that people will actually care about and get excited about. I know like this last one, like at that point, like it's, you know, I had already raised quite a bit more than I set out, but it was really fun and cool because I wanted to donate all those plushies and so did everybody else. So like I posted this on my social media and it really spread around that people were like, let's make this happen. Let's see all those kiddos that were books are being donated to. Let's see them get those plushies as well. I was really blessed to meet my goal on day one and I was like, well, great, but crap, I haven't really thought that much like about my stress goals yet because I was so busy planning the Kickstarter with other things. And so like, I, I do think I had like the first like one planned. And then, so I like, I think I had like given like the first one or two as a teaser before we reached them. And then as we went, I was like, I would just, you know, rip one open, like, okay, this is the next one. Can we do it? It's really fun. And if you do it right, people will can get excited about it. So it's a good tactic to kind of keep momentum going. And also launch day, huge deal. It really sets the tone for your campaign. Like if, if it totally blows, don't, be down on yourself because I see people come back from it. Absolutely. But it really sets the tone and the better you can do, the better you can hype it up at the beginning. A, you'll be more relaxed because hopefully you'll reach your goal earlier than later. And B, it really does it. it statistically, you, it's more successful campaigns because launch day tends to be 
your biggest day. And then the date, like days following it just kind of like wanes. And then in the middle, it really plateaus. Almost everybody goes through that plateau and it's not fun, but it's normal. And then, so, you know, just the more you can do to keep momentum. And then at the end, it kind of picks up again and it's a roller coaster. Yeah. But the more you can do for momentum, the better and stretch goals can really help out with that. So yeah, that's my recommendation with stretch goals. And then reward tiers. I kind of alluded to this already, but the term on Kickstarter for like the items that you're offering are rewards. And so people pledge for different rewards. They pick different tiers that tend to be in packages. Like for instance, my first packages tend to be like ebook and video book. And then like the hardcover book, maybe like have a sticker with it. And then also the ebook and video book with that. And then like, for me, I have the plushies, the book and plushies. People do it this way, but I hate to see it because it really doesn't take advantage of the psychology behind Kickstarter reward tiers. You want to do instead of like one book, $20, two books, $40, you want it to be like one book, $20, two books, $38, if you get what I mean, and so on and so on and so on. Increase value with each reward tier to help incentivize people to bump up tiers. So for me, my strategy for that was, of course, lowering the prices as people bumped up. Like I would do different bundles, get creative with it. It's great incentive to have like, you know, the the price is getting lower and lower. Like on my first campaign, I had like every pledge $65 and above gets the special upgrade, special bonus. They can choose one of the t-shirt transfers or for our campaign I'm working on right now. I'm not doing t-shirt transfers. It was fun, but it wasn't really cost effective. It was worth it for me because people did bump up. It works. It worked. It really worked. But just so happened to have tons of my gratitude journal and coloring books that I'm going to use for that benefit on my upcoming campaign that everybody $65 and up gets that coloring book. So yeah, like just try to be be creative. And not everybody feels like getting this into it. It's not a must, but I'm here to just kind of tell you how to maximize your reach and your campaign. So that's a strategy that really helped me just, you know, really pay attention to that, that reward tier ladder and make sure better value each tier, because I know it impacts me whenever I'm back backing a Kickstarter that yeah, whenever I see one that doesn't do it, I just, I see a missed opportunity for the author because it it really is something that sets Kickstarter apart from other pre-order systems is that those reward tiers, it works really well. So designing your campaign is like my favorite part because I love doing graphic design. You want to like clearly articulate your story and the values of your book. A lot of the best like selling stories on Kickstarter tend to be ones that really you can develop a social emotional connection to them. So like tap into that, whatever it is for you. People love to see the story behind the story. That's what grabs potential backers the most on Kickstarter. And if you have illustrations, like use them. A balance of text to visuals is really important always, but on Kickstarter, it really helps. Like, it, So you might have like a block of text and then a visual, and it can be really beneficial to have on some of those graphics pieces of the text as well, like headlines to grab people's attention like here having like you know this included with every order $65 and up like I have it written here somewhere but I have pointed out on the graphic as well because some people are a lot of people in fact are just going to skim and this as well like instead of just saying featured on this like having those logos there and Mm -hmm. just you know that balance of visuals to text is really helpful. So I highly recommend that. So this is my campaign that I am actively working on right now. I apologize. I don't have my book cover on it because I haven't revealed it yet. So 
that's why it says in certain places, dog at the zoo cover goes here. But this image, this image is what people will see on the Kickstarter page whenever they're scroll scrolling. Don't rely on the Kickstarter page to like bring your audience because you need to bring your audience first, bring the social proof with you. And then when people are scrolling, they'll see, oh, this book is already 113% funded. What's the commotion on this. I got to look at it. So bring, bring your social proof with you. And then hopefully people will join you, but that big image at the top, that's what people see whenever they're scrolling. So you want it to be a dynamic image that will grab people's attention. So yeah, like, you know, just between you and your illustrator or graphic designer, make something pretty, um, grab people's attention. And then you know, early on, you want to have something to hook them, whether that's your cover, which I do recommend. And then just starting to like, I go back and forth. It's all independent on your story. Is it better to tell like the story of the book first or the story behind the story? Usually it's the story of the book because that's what people are wanting. You're wanting them to be interested in to buy. My first campaign, I think I did it the other way. I kind of started telling a little bit about us because it's our real life story. It's about this service dog. So that's where I started and kind of about what we've been through in life. And that was our social emotional connection. So I started there to hopefully hook people and then got into, you know, about the book itself. I'm flipping it here because... I don't know why it just seemed to fit better. So, and in fact, it's kind of all intermingled on this one that as you can see, we have photographs, like photographs aren't right for every campaign, but if it is something inspired from your own life, like in our case, I know people like to see the real life dog and you know what it's actually like to go to the zoo with a dog. And then of course, just kind of like detailing what is special about your book. What is special about it? In our case, it's not, you know, we love zoo books, but it's like, a, it's a special kind of zoo book where, yes, it's about, you know, the friendships between a dog and the animals she meets there, but also a dog and the people she meets there. Our social emotional connection in our first two books is like silver linings and positivity. This one, it's like about being somebody's silver lining, like teaching kids what it means to bring joy and kindness to somebody going through a difficult moment. And also we are about disability inclusion. So we're just highlighting those features. Like we have like things more detailed in the actual body text, but we have these bigger graphics that kind of give the headlines of what our mission, what our story is. And then, you know, just a little bit more about us as individuals and our inspiration. And then, you know, getting into the rewards, people want to see what they're getting. So pretty pictures go a long way. It doesn't have to be super detailed. I, like I said, this is what I love to do. So I do spend a lot of time on it and trying to figure out new ways to make things impactful, but it doesn't, you know, always have to be that way. Just something eye catching. Mm -hmm. And then telling people how they can help a lot of people on kickstarter already know but the audience you bring with you might not and i will get to like building your audience and educating them before but it's still good to have some of that education on the page itself telling mm -hmm. people this is how you do this it's not difficult it's just different than ordering off of amazon so that's helpful and then wrapping up we haven't put our photos in here yet but just you know, about us and a thank you. Like I said, the first thing they see is that image, that image when they're scrolling. But as soon as they click that, like if they get into your campaign at the top is a video. You don't not you don't have to do a video, but like there's like, I think 80% of successful Kickstarter campaigns have a video. So it's highly recommended, especially like this day and age, people are used to like ingesting information in video form you know, like Facebook and Instagram reels. And those are short. It can be longer than a reel and it probably should be, but try to, you know, you got to hook people quick like that. And it doesn't have to be fancy. It just has to catch people and really tell your story in a good way. I'm putting my first campaign into the chat. I'm not going to like make you guys sit here and watch my video, but you know, I created that video myself. I don't have 
previous video training. I'm not like, and don't ask me to do yours because you don't want me to, I promise. But I am a do-it-yourselfer and I was going to hire somebody. And by the time I was gathering like all the video clips and music and such to send them, it was like, like halfway done with this. So I just did it. It's up to you at what point you do it, but I highly recommend that you do it. Like if you don't have time to like figure out how to edit it, it's so worth it. Like it doesn't have to cost much. Like if there's something you're going to invest in, honestly, that's a good place to invest to just use a little money Mm -hmm. to pay for somebody to edit the, yeah, it can be so worth it. When should you launch? And the answer is, this is a bit flippant. There's more to it than this, but whenever you have the audience that will help you reach your goal, whether, you know, AJ asked you write it before or after you write your book, honestly, everybody does it at different times. For me, like I like to be well into the creation. Both times I won't be done with my illustrations while the Kickstarter is running. I wasn't with the first one, but I do like to have some illustrations. And if you're trying to fund your illustrations, I've seen people just get one or two from their illustrator and it, yeah. and make a beautiful campaign and then use funding for the illustration. Yeah. And otherwise you can be at whatever point in the creation process. You do put in an estimate like shipping time. People are late all the time. I was late. They do advise, like, it's better to have a buffer and be early than late. So do as I say, not as I do. Okay. I think as long as you're communicating well with your backers yeah, exactly. and letting them know, because exactly. especially when they had issues with paper shortages or shipping containers, you know, from China getting stuck in port and things like that, those kinds of things can happen. And that's part of the risk. They exactly. may have to wait a little longer for their book. And you'll find most Kickstarter backers are incredibly understanding. They're just happy to be a part of the journey. So yeah, I'm sure there's limits to that, but uh, yeah, just keep bring them along for the ride. And they're usually very understanding. I say, whenever you have the audience that will help you reach your goal, what does that mean? How do you know that? So my biggest piece of advice when it comes to Kickstarter is doing the outreach. Like I said, don't count on a Kickstarter platform to bring you customers. That is a misconception that some people think they post on Kickstarter and they just kind of wait that it's going to, you know, blast out and people are going to just come in. Some people will find you, but like I said, a lot of the time it's from the social proof of a quickly growing campaign. So you need to bring your audience with you. Your audience can be from anywhere. It can be social media. It can be within your own community. You know, people say don't count on friends and family. And that's true. Don't count on them. If you're blessed, then you'll have people in your community who want to support you. So this is how I do outreach. And this will scare some people away. It's not how you have to do it, but I've had at least one other author say that she knows that this is why her campaign hit the goal so quick. And I know it's why mine did also. The way I do outreach with my first book, I started posting about my book. Even before I knew I was going to do Kickstarter, I start posting I'm like, you know, and announce we're doing it. People hopefully will get excited. Hopefully you're not saying it to crickets. From that very first post about my book on Facebook, Instagram, everywhere. Well, and I'm just a, fa- honestly, I'm a Facebook and Instagram. I'm not on Twitter. It's not to say those platforms aren't where you should be. It's wherever you are comfortable. And for me, it's Facebook and Instagram. So I would look through every single comment in anybody who showed an interest. I made a list. I wrote down a list and I don't remember how long the list got before my first book. But as I was approaching my campaign, once I made the decision, I was doing Kickstarter. I sent every single one of those people a message, not a blast email. You can do that. And for the people with limit more limited time, do it. It's better than nothing. But if you have the time, that one-on-one outreach, like people, it makes people actually respond, <laughs> like as opposed to like just like blasting out an email, because most people don't respond to those. They Yes, at least they'll know what's happening and a lot of them will show up. But the idea is you want to have an idea, you know, get that response so you can gauge how many people you might be able to expect. This is how I set my goal. I reached out and the amount of responses I got and you know some of those people won't actually do it. And you also hope and pray that more people will and they will inevitably people will find your campaign that during the campaign educate your audience about kickstarter because not a lot of them have a firm understanding like i said there was there's those misconceptions 
So, you know, exactly what I said about it before. You want to make sure that your audience knows that. So when I send these messages, I say something along the lines of, hi, so-and-so. And, you know, try to, if you can, like, if you know the person well enough, something a little personal, like, and then I remember that you were looking forward to my book. I wanted to give you an update. We're getting really close to our launch. We are going to be using a platform called Kickstarter. And I explain to them what Kickstarter is, how it works. I say, launch day is such a big deal on Kickstarter. The better we do on launch day, the more likely we are to succeed. Are you still planning to purchase our book? If you know, if so, we would really appreciate it if you could come out, whether it's on launch day or not, but support us on Kickstarter to help us reach our goal. So I both use it as a way to get a response, engage how many people to expect, and also to educate them. I also make posts on social media with the education so that even people that I'm not aware of that are considering it, they will get that education as well. But I make sure to do it in the outreach as well. I didn't do this with my first campaign. It was probably me not fully thinking it through. But with my second campaign, I'm also utilizing a landing page. There's different platforms. It can be whatever you use for your mailing list. I use something called Backerkit. It's a plan that a resource I use for Kickstarter that helps me with fulfillment. It is, there are fees. So, you know, some people think it's worth it. Some think it's not. But since I do have it, I am using it for my landing page. It, it takes out a step for me. They can enter their email address and they will get an email when we launch. So with the landing page, I kind of, I say, by entering your email address, it helps us gauge, you know, helps us know how to set our goal. And it alerts you automatically when we launch so that you can come out and get the book on Kickstarter. And then on the landing page, I'll put the landing page in the chat so that you can see it as an example. It's a good learning opportunity to follow along with other people's journeys. And like I said, you can use different platforms for this. This is just the one I happen to use. And um, yeah, so that's kind of my system for outreach and outreach, like, yes, to your audience. And then also to like potential media coverage, like, Oh, I, yeah, that's a great point, Sarah. Yeah, I tried to have some media coverage lined up. Like, I don't even remember what ones I did, but like, um, I know I had like at least one podcast on launch day, that kind of thing. It's a lot, but it all adds up and you don't have to do all of it. Select and choose the things that are most feasible for you that could have the most reach. But those are the things that are most feasible for me and have the widest reach. So that's how I build my audience, but other people do it different ways. And I always marvel at the creativity people have when they're doing that. So, and then, like I said, you want to launch when you know you have the audience, but then there are statistics like, you know, it's not recommended to launch around holidays, especially Christmas time. Just, you don't want people to be otherwise occupied, right? When you launch Tuesdays and Wednesdays are statistically the best and weekends the worst that being said I launched on a Saturday because I had a gut feeling like when I would do my outreach I got the quickest responses on Saturday so I was like well maybe for my audience that's what they when they're available so I did it I don't know if that had anything to do with success but yeah just get a feel for your audience but statistically Tuesdays and Wednesdays and avoiding Mm -hmm. holidays and then what to do during your campaign continue to do that outreach media coverage outreach find other people to collab with that's something before my kickstarter i like sought out like instagrammers within my niche and sent them messages like hey would you be willing to share my kickstarter on our launch day and so we had a number of like influencers blast out our launch on their instagrams that kind of thing post updates on social media and your campaign page. If you post an update on your campaign page, everybody who's backed gets an alert and you can have public posts that people see when they look at your campaign, that kind of thing. Continue working on the creation of your rewards if they're not ready yet. You will probably have to answer a lot of questions. One tip that I have, people will get confused on how to back your campaign. So on my first campaign, I was able to kind of give people like a basic... This is how you do it. And here's the tutorial if you have any more questions. 
reach out if you have trouble and people always have their questions answered in the tutorial. So not a lot of people do that, but it was worth it to me. Um, yeah. And researching best like mailing materials and such for fulfillment. What's next? If your campaign is successful, congratulations. That's wonderful. Kickstarter can take up to two weeks to process all of the payments and then it's delivered into your bank account. You send out something called a survey. Your backers like that will gather their mailing information, add-on information of like they can continue to add things to their pledge at that point, potentially. Kickstarter doesn't have that yet built into their system, but you can have like, if you want, like people can list if they want other things. Backer kit, the system that I use for my surveys, they do have that and that people can actually add stuff to their pledge. And then my advice is to try and keep the momentum going even after the campaign. It's a transition because you go from like a month of like a blitz marketing campaign to what exactly? Like I remember being like, okay, what do I do now? Try not to have radio silence on your social media and Kickstarter. Get excited with people, like share the celebration, post updates about the process, brings them along on the journey. It reassures them that yeah, things are moving along. The project they backed is worth believing in. And don't miss the opportunity for more sales. Like set up somewhere to continue doing pre-orders. Like from the time between my campaign ending and the time that my books arrived, I think I got almost five thousand and more dollars in sales from pre-orders. So wow, that's amazing, Sarah. Yeah. So like, don't miss that opportunity, like set it up, whether it's on your website. Like I said, I use backer kit fulfillment. It's a lot of work, but my favorite things for fulfillment are backer kit and pirate ship and a label printer. The label printer is worth the what, like $80. I promise you can use it after your, all your orders. I use it for every single order I mail out. Yeah. And then with pirate ship, it's fantastic because I don't know if you're familiar. They not only make things easy, but they also get discounts with postal service and UPS now. This has been a lot of information. So I'm sure people will want to revisit this. And I always recommend that, you know, continue to do your research and watch other webinars and things like that on Kickstarter. Going thank up. you so much, Sarah, for doing this for us. This has been really helpful. And I know we're going to be having more information. If you are interested in hearing more about the work group we're going to put together for Kickstarter, then join that Kickstarter Made Simple Facebook group. We'll be po- posting more information there, trying to get a sense as to how many people are interested in joining and when. So if you do have plans for Kickstarter, post some information there. And Sarah and I do monitor that Facebook group. Yep. So would love to help you guys however I can reach out or, you know, we have so much fun in the workshop. So yeah, thanks for showing up guys. It was fun. Thank you everybody.